All right, we've been in the New Testament. We did an Acts the last couple of weeks, so I thought, well, this uh, this week we can go back to Old Testament for a little bit. We're going to be, uh, when we get to our scripture here in just a moment, we'll be in Exodus chapter 4. So if you if you have your Bible with you, you can go ahead and turn there, But uh, and we'll, we'll read from Exodus 4 here in just a moment. Uh, of course, this is a, a part of the life of uh, Moses uh, that we read about here in the early part uh, of the book of Exodus, and uh, and we see, we see this is a very important pivotal time for, for Moses here. You know, in chapter 3 uh, of Exodus, uh, you know, Moses had had to flee to Midian, and he had, uh, you know, he had killed the Egyptian, and, was, you know, that was witnessed by, by some witnesses there that saw that and threatened to tell on him, uh, you know, and so he, he, had to, he had to make haste and get away uh, from, from Egypt, where he had been as a, uh, as a prince of Egypt, and so... You know, here, he, he, as he flees to the desert, as he flees to the wilderness, you know, he found work uh, there in the wilderness as, as a shepherd or as a herder, you know, and he worked there, and he, that's where he worked for his, uh, his soon-to-be father-in-law uh, for those 40 years. And if you remember, uh, that, that was Jethro uh, that, that we read about and, uh, and hear about in, in, in the Old Testament there. He was Moses' father-in-law. So, you know, it was during that, that 40-year time frame, uh, or 40-year 40, 40 period there that in the wilderness that God was continuing to prepare Moses, you know, his whole life had been a preparation for what he would call him to do and what he would ask him to do in leading the children of Israel out of captivity. But again, this was just another stage of, of that preparation uh, to carry out that task that he had been chosen for. So and when we, we get to chapter 3 um, after that, you know, after that period of time there that he had been uh, attending, attending the flocks, and then we see the uh, the burning bush experience. Of course, uh, that that story again uh, uh, that we all remember from from Sunday school when we were when we were coming up, and uh, you know that was one of the one of the ones definitely that that we remember. You know, probably if you did something in Sunday school with that in the class, and probably the kids all had to had to take off their shoes and whatnot and pretend, you know, that they were they were on holy ground, you know, with, with, in the Sunday school room there. You know, and that's one of those things. Those those things that are that we're so mindful of, and that, that those stories that really we remember and stick with us. But we know we see at, at the burning bush and at that period of time uh, of Moses's encounter. You know, he, he gave Moses some very specific and explicit directions and instructions as to what he wanted him to do. You know, he said, "Moses, go to Pharaoh, tell him let my people go." You know, remember that. And and, and uh, of course, we know we know how that turned out for Pharaoh. You know, bring the Israelites out of out of Egypt. And of course, he was also supposed to go, you know, to the Israelite, uh, the elders and the leaders uh, of his people as well. And he had to go to them also and, kind of, you know, and convince them uh, that he was sent by God to lead them out to the promised land. So, so we know then from reading that, that, that Moses did exactly what God told him to do. No <coughs> question that, right? Yeah, okay. uh, we, can, we can close the Bible up and go home for the Easter. No, no it's not exactly, not exactly how things turned out. Uh, if, we, if we read a little bit further, we, we know that Moses had some objections. So that means we're going to have to stay here for, for another 20 minutes or so tonight and talk about that. But uh, so we'll read a little bit about that tonight and look a little bit more closely. Uh, before we reread the section in, in chapter 4, uh, you know, we see Moses in, in verse 11 of uh, chapter 3. You know, he, he, he questions right there. Uh, he questions God. He says, you know, who am I uh, that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? You know, you know to paraphrase that, I'm sure the thought was, well, certainly somebody else would be better for this than me. You know, God, you've got, you've got the wrong guy, uh, obviously, with that. So, you know, somebody else could obviously be more deserving of this task than I am. You know, I'm sure it was an unenviable task, really, but God had appointed uh, Moses to, to be the man for the job. You know, but I think we look then in verse 12 of chapter 3, you know, God's answer uh, to that. What, you know, what does, God, what does God promise him in, in, in verse 12 right there? What does he say to him? I will be with you. He says, God said, I will be with you. Right, we're good. Right. So, you know, you would think that answer would hopefully be sufficient. Uh, hopefully it would be sufficient for us. We know that's true, you know, but it's not always, we don't always act like it's true, if, you know, if, I, if, if you understand what I'm saying. You know, we've all heard that phrase, you know, it says, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it, right? You know, I mean, we could really shorten that up to more or less say, God said it, and that settles it. You know, what I, what I believe or don't believe um, doesn't make something true or not. 
you know, so Moses, in his mind, he continues to go through the potential what if scenarios and what if questions. You know, what if Pharaoh doesn't believe me? What if, uh, what if the children of Israel, when I go to them, they ask me, who is it that sent you? What should I tell them? You know, he says, tell them I am that I am sent me. And, you know, of course, that was Yahweh. Uh, you know, what if they ask me a question that I can't answer, that I don't know? And again, if we look back up, we would hope that God's answer, I will be with you, would have been sufficient to allay his fears. But as we arrive in chapter 4, Moses is still talking and, and going back and forth with God, and we see that here, telling him that he's not the man for the job. But we're going to go ahead and read a little bit lengthy tonight, but we're going to go ahead and read those first 17 verses of chapter 4, and then, and then uh, move on from there. It says, uh, Moses answered and says, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and, uh, and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A staff, he replied. And the Lord said, Throw it on the ground. And Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. And then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand uh, and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took a hold of the snake, and, turned, and it turned back uh, into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. And then he said, put your hand inside your cloak. And so Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was leprous, like snow. Now God said, put it back into your cloak. And he said to Moses, so Moses put it back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. In verse 8. And then the Lord says, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first miraculous sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water you take uh, from the river will become blood on the ground. And Moses said to the Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Uh, for the Lord said to him, Who gave the man his mouth, and who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. Verse 13. But Moses said, O Lord, please send someone else to do it. And then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and his heart will be glad when he sees you. Shall speak, uh, you shall speak to him and put words into his mouth that I will help you both to speak and will teach you what to do. And he will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if you were he were your mouth, and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform the miraculous signs with it. Okay, a lot there. But first of all, we see God showed great patience. You know, up to this point with Moses, and he answered Moses' objections, and he gave him he gave him uh, tools, I suppose, to, to help convince the, the the people and help alleviate some of Moses' fears. You know, we read uh, in Acts uh, in uh, Exodus 34 and also in Psalms. You know, talks about the Lord is slow to anger, and we're grateful that He is slow to anger, but He will not entertain our disobedience indefinitely. He does have a point. But what did it take, or what does it take, for this tongue-tied shepherd uh, to turn him into a force strong enough to deliver God's people from slavery, uh, from the most powerful nation on earth at the time? You know, God chose Moses to be his instrument uh, to be a deliverance. Or it could have been anybody, really, you know, but God chose, God chose Moses, the reluctant fugitive. You know... Uh, Today, I'm sure it still troubles God to see people uh, that he loves, his people uh, living enslaved to sin and living uh, enslaved to particular lifestyles, uh, you know. Uh, but he used Moses and Aaron to speak his message to the people. And we think today about who is it God can use today to speak for him and on his behalf and speak truth uh, to the world. You know, if it's easy to look at our world and turn on the news in the afternoon and we uh, we see how our, our culture is, how we bought into the lies of, of the devil as a culture, how, uh, you know, it's easy to be disheartened 
by that. You know, it's easy to kind of throw up our hands and say, what's the point? You know, I think we've gone too far. Is there any hope uh, for our world? Is there any hope for our nation? Um, but I would say, I can say, don't give up because God has not given up on us. He has not given up on this world. He said, you know, he is delaying his return. He is delaying the end. He is delaying the final judgment. He's merciful and doesn't want any to perish. As it says, 2 Peter, 2 Peter 3, uh, verse 8, it says, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. It says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And then that goes on in verse 10, and talks about the day of the Lord, you know, coming like a thief in the night, and the return uh, uh, the end time, whatever, whatever that will look like. However God decides for it to look, that's what it will look like. So God still has a mission until he returns, until he comes back, until he intervenes in history and time. He still has a mission for his people. He still has a mission for his church to be salt and light uh, in this world until he returns to call his bride home. And we have to be willing to be the people with whom or through whom God will work. And if we look back at Moses again for just a, again for a little bit, we'll put back there. We see, you know, the Israelites have been living under this affliction uh, with their Egyptian masters. We know uh, about the call of Moses. We read about that, about the call of Moses at the burning bush and how Moses became God's instrument for change. And he, he was this instrument, you know, how did, what did he give him or how did he use that? You know, he used really by what he had. Uh, he gave him the what he had in his hand at the time, if we look at it, you know, as a God, he, he says, and right there at the very beginning of chapter 4, uh, you know, Moses objects, he says, what if they say this, what if they don't believe me, what if they say you didn't really appear, and then God just says, the Lord God says, what is in your hand, you know, it's the, it's the staff right there, so God gave him something that he had right there, seemingly ordinary object. Uh, that he had with him at the time to use for his purpose and uh, to help get the, the job done. You know, God gives talents, he gives abilities, uh, he gives gifts to a lot of people. But I think he, he still uses ordinary and less charismatic people as well in personality to get some of the jobs done that he wants done uh, to accomplish his work. You know, we've all seen situations where style sometimes wins out over substance. You know, people are deceived by style and the substance is not there. You know, you can think of, you know, elections and things where sometimes the more stylistic candidate has won out over the more substantive candidate. I'll let you draw your own conclusions as to who those people are. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, I'm not going there. Okay, so, uh, but, uh, but again, he allowed Moses, he was allowing Moses to be his chosen vessel. And the children of Israel, they could focus on the power of the message and not be distracted by the attraction of the messenger being given his, his persuasiveness. You know, yes, God was angry. He was disappointed with Moses. He rightly so by Moses' lack of faith and lack of belief. But God made allowances, you know, to, uh, to take up or to make up for the, oh, his shortcomings. You know, he could have just sent Moses out there and I said, go, you know, just do it, you know, and, and but he... He could have sent him out there empty-handed. He could have sent him alone, but he didn't do that. You know, God provided something. He provided what he needed to accomplish the task that he had for him to do. You know, it still took cooperation. It still took effort. It still took some bravery. It still took uh, perseverance, you know, to get that job done. But he gave him tools. He gave him what he needed to get that job done. You know, again, as I mentioned, the staff, um, you know, God, if you read, when you read, I didn't really honestly look at this until today or yesterday when I was reading this. He says, you know, to throw the, throw it down. You know, God told Moses to throw it down. You know, the staff, and, and then it turned into a snake. He didn't tell him it was going to turn into a snake. You know, before he threw it down. You know, I wonder if he would have actually let go of it if he knew it was going to turn into a snake. You know, or not. You know, I could, I just have this image in my mind, and I laugh of the a man in a robe and a turban running from a snake. You know, you know, you know, what that might have looked like, I, I don't know. But, uh, uh, and, you know, but then he, he showed up.
we tend to sell we tend to sell Moses a little bit short sometimes, or, or judge him. But but then God tell, tells him to pick up the snake, and, and he did. You know, he doesn't tell them the snake's going to turn back into a staff either. You know, he probably did more. Moses did more there than probably eighty percent of us would have done. I imagine. So. Uh, Again, Moses showed faith not only by throwing it down, but by picking it up again. And I mean, we don't try that someday. I don't know. We can do that at the fall festival, okay? We'll have, we'll have, we'll have some snakes at the fall festival and see who wants to grab some. No, I'm kidding. No, we, we're not those kind of Baptists, I'm sorry. Um, all right. I'm getting, I get an off track here. There we go. I'll go first if y'all. Okay. The other sign, though, that we did see, too, was. Um, about the sign of the, the hand and the and his, putting the hand in his cloak and again you know it was leprous and then he put it back in and he drew it back out and it was whole and you see that and then um, as well and what that must have been like but um, you know finally God provided him a partner in ministry he provided Aaron for it someone to speak for with him and for him you know Moses God gave Moses the words and Moses gave the words to Aaron uh, but but God gave him uh, someone to speak and someone uh, to help him with that, he wasn't going to stand there alone. So those, but those words did come from uh, from God to Moses to Aaron. So even so, we see in verse 15, of chapter 4, God promises again. He says, "I will help both of you to speak, and I will teach you what to do." So God still he, he reassures him. You know, God did exactly what He promised to do uh, for Moses in, in verse what 29 of chapter 4. Uh, if we move on there, it just tells us, um, there it says, Moses and uh, Aaron brought together the elders and the Israelites. They told them everything the Lord had said uh, to Moses. And then he performed the signs before the people, the, the staff and the, and the hand and the leprosy. And it says, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them, they had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. So God filled his part of the deal like he always does, you know. He had the words to speak to tell Pharaoh when he, when he went to Pharaoh. Even though Pharaoh's heart, and heart was hardened and he didn't believe, God still gave him the words to speak. Moses was faithful to speak the words that had been given to him. He wasn't, faith, he wasn't responsible for Pharaoh's response, but he, was, he faithfully spoke the words. So, so this was God, again, working through Moses. Moses was the vessel that had been chosen by God. It wasn't Moses' skill or talent. That eventually that made this happen, but the deliverance eventually did. Uh, so I think we ask ourselves if we look at that and we using our our question from God uh, there uh, uh, in verse two. It says, "What is that in your hand?" We got look at our. We turn that around to ourselves and we can ask ourselves, "What is in our hand today? What is in your hand uh, today?" You may not have the answer to that question immediately. That might be something you have to go home and think about. But uh, the, the, uh, something to think about there. I, um, as I was again, I was looking at this, and I, 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 a couple of months ago on a Wednesday night, I, I spoke about how comparison is the thief of joy. Uh, you may or may not remember that, but I think comparison also steals something from us in another way, more than joy. I think comparison sometimes can rob us of our confidence in the God's plan for us. God came to Moses and gave him a clear plan and a clear direction to accomplish his plan to free the people. But Moses doubted. Moses said, who am I to do this? Moses said, send someone else, not me. You know, consider plan B. And he did that because he didn't think he was able, or he didn't think he was gifted, or he didn't think you know, he was the right person for the job. So he uh, comparing himself to others that might be more capable in the world's eye, or in his own eye, than he was. But in a way, also, we, we feel badly for Moses in that way, but also, I think, well, I think for Moses, that was a form of disobedience uh, as well, when he when he told God, you've got the wrong guy. You know, if you've got, if you uh, tell your kids to do something at home, around the house, you know, hey, I need you to do this for me or that for me, and they go, and they were to look at you and say, oh, Dad, I think you've got the wrong wrong kid. You know, uh, I think you need to go tell my brother to do You know, try that with Trenton and Preston, okay? You know, something like, you've got the wrong kid. You know, somebody else needs to do that. I mean, I, I, you know, if, if we think about it, if God, our God, our Father, and us as his children, 
that's that's not our uh, that's not a good response for us when he when he gives us a task, he gives us a job that we tell him to try somebody else. So as long as we wake up in the morning and as long as we have breath in our lungs, I believe that God has a purpose or a mission for us to carry out. Second Corinthians chapter five tells us really the ministry or the mission of the church in the New Testament is the ministry of reconciliation. From chapter 5, Paul writes this in verse 17. He says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Uh, the old is gone and the new is, new is here. All is, this is from God who reconciled himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And then it goes on in, in that. It says, And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation, that we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. You know, God gave the words to Moses, and God, Moses gave the words to Aaron, but those words came from God. We see he is making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, as Paul was writing to the church. But this is also instructional for us. So in that essence, Moses was God's messenger, and in the, in the New Testament, we are God's messengers in the world that we live in now. So if I could finish this today and wrap this up by saying, let's apply this. You know, you need to go teach a class, and you need to serve on a committee, and you need to go work in the nursery. Um, uh, I, I'm, we're not going to do that tonight. You know, we can save that for another day. Uh, you know, but consider that if you would. I appreciate it. So. Um, I know, or work with the youth, honestly, too, we need that as well. But, um, you know, what do we already have in our hands that we can use? Whatever we have in our hands may not seem like much, but what we have has come to us by the permission and the providence of God Almighty. And we see through the Bible, from Moses to David to Mary, I mean, God uses ordinary, un. un unskilled or people. He uses, uses obedient people as who he uses. So, uh, and we see that people that are seemingly insignificant. You now, God uses used Moses' life and his experiences. Uh, I'm sure he had a lot of time there in the desert to think about things and, and wonder about things and, uh, and get, his, get his mind right, hopefully. Uh, hopefully none of us will have to go anywhere for 40 years and come back and, uh, and figure it out, but, uh, uh, but mostly, again, what God uses is a willing heart. I, uh, I don't know where, you've probably heard this before, it's nothing new, I don't know when I first heard it, but uh, like Moses, you know, had to be convinced. I think God is really, he's looking for people, he's looking for churches as well, we'll put ourselves in the context of the Myrtle Grove Baptist Church, that are, that are and the, the acronym, of course, is is FAT. He's looking for fat people. He's looking for people, first of all, that are faithful and available and teachable. I think I think that's a pretty common common thing. But uh, you know, Moses was faithful first. He was faithful in tending to the sheep for those forty years there in the wilderness. His time was coming. We may be in a season of life where we aren't exactly sure what God wants us to do, or we are not exactly sure what the next step is for us. Uh, but God is using this time in the wilderness to teach us and to mold us to answer his call when we are ready. You know, we, we have applying that again to, to the world growth. We're waiting for a pastor. We don't have a pastor, but we still we still work while we wait. You know, you're still, you know, we don't wait and, and wait. We wait and work. And hopefully that will be our mindset. But wherever we are, we need to carefully carry out the task at hand. And I, I thought of the talents of the parable. He said, he who is faithful in a little will be ruler over much more. So whatever we're doing now, let's be faithful and do our best. Let's be available. When God calls us, we need to answer that call. Remember, there's always excuses that we can make, like Moses. Somebody's more talented. Somebody's a better speaker than I am. I don't have time. I already did my, I already, I already did that, and I retired from that ministry. Uh, and on and on those things go sometimes. You know, Jesus addressed this also in, in Luke, uh, in another, uh, another parable, uh, when he talks about the master's banquet. 
know, and he, the master invited all the people to the banquet, to, to the house. You know, one guy, he bought a, a team of oxen, and he had to train the oxen how to use them, uh, how to do whatever ox do. And, you know, another guy, he recently got married, you know, he said he needed to spend time with his family. The other one had bought a field. He said, you know, I've got to go look at my new field and, and, and appreciate it, you know, and, and I don't have time to come to the banquet. You know, they missed out on the feast that the master had prepared for them because they were too busy with the temporary things of this life to answer that invitation. Let's not miss out because we are telling God we aren't available. Let's not miss out because we're telling God that we're too busy or because we don't, we're not the person for the job. And the last thing about being after faithful and available is to be teachable. And I, I, uh, I think a lack of a teachable spirit uh, is usually accompanied by, by a character trait uh, that isn't well spoken of in the Bible, and that's pride. You know, a proud person always thinks that they're the smartest person in the room, or a proud person thinks no one else can tell them something that they don't already know. I don't think you ever meet the smartest person in the room, let me know. Uh, go talk. I know it's not me. You know, Proverbs... Uh, Solomon in Proverbs said, uh, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. But let's not be too proud to learn new things. <clears throat> and also, just in a physical set manifestation of learning and, be, and having an active mind is it's a lifelong process. You know, we never fully arrive until we die, and then we arrive in heaven, hopefully. But if we aren't growing and expanding our mind and our skills that God gave us, then we are, in a lot of cases, we're shortening our lives, you know, physically. You know, our mentally, you don't exercise your brain. It, and you, like any other muscle you exercise, it, it, tends to, uh, it tends to deteriorate. So our minds that God gave us, we need to exercise them and stimulate them uh, to help us to stay alert. So and I know that as we get older, we hopefully we realize the older we get, the more things that we don't know, you know, and I, I just, uh, in this regard, I had the thought of my, uh, my dad in this regard, you know, he, he passed away 10 years ago, actually, this, this a couple weeks ago, hard to believe, but I know even, that he, he was 87, but even the man was, until he wasn't able, until he wasn't into, you know, until uh, uh, he wasn't able, you know, he was always reading, he was always this, you know, he was always fully engaged in things, gratefully for, gratefully for him. You know, me and my mom were working uh, uh, as a, teaching English as a second language to uh, international, mainly Chinese students there at the uh, University of Alabama in Huntsville, you know, and, and that. He was always, he was always, just always, his mind was always working, you know, and I just hope I'm, I'm half as right as my dad is when I get get older, but uh, but I just, like I said, he was my hero in that regard. But, uh, but take a personal inventory if you can. Let's say, what talent, what gift do you have? What skills can we develop? And are our ears remaining open to God's direction and continuing plans for our life? In Moses' case, it took some convincing, but I pray that we will be faithful and available and teachable to answer God's call for us now and in the future. So I pray with me. God, again, we're thankful for examples of the Bible and Scripture that we can read about and that we can learn from and that uh, uh, that you that, that are there for us, God. We're thankful for the for your word and for for, uh, for the gift that it is, Father. And at each time we read it, it shows us something different because we know, Lord, that your word is living and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, Father, but we, we, we're thankful for that gift tonight, God. We just pray, Lord, as we go through the week, uh, pray, Lord, to bring us back safely on Sunday. We just pray, Lord, that you, uh, again, just help us to keep our eyes open for opportunities to, to reach people, to love people, uh, to serve people, God. And uh, we just uh, 